Hello, welcome to today's presentation. My name is Vanessa Torres. I'm the program manager for visitor services here at Lyndon B. Johnson National Historical Park. Joining me today, we have Annette Becker. Annette is a fashion historian and arts educator who focuses on accessible material cultural studies. In her current role as the director of the Texas Fashion Collection at the University of North Texas, Becker curates exhibitions and learning opportunities with the collection's nearly 20,000 historic and designer garments and accessories. Previous professional experience includes curatorial and museum education positions in institutions around the country. Becker holds an MA in art history and a graduate certificate in art museum education from the University of North Texas, where she currently pursues a PhD in history with a focus on oral history and digital humanities methodologies, as well as gender and sexuality networks and cultural memory. Please help me welcome Annette Becker. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Vanessa. I'm so pleased to be here with you all today and sharing some of the research that I got to conduct while at the LBJ National Historical Park um, over the past year and a half. I'd really like to thank the Western National Parks Association for their support of this project um, as their funding and professional support were really critical for this project to happen. Um, if you look at this slide, you can see the Western National Parks Association logo, as well as some credits um, for the people who were able to support this project through their professional time and skills and expertise. Um, as you can see, it involves several people from the LBJ National Historical Park. Um, and again, we're really grateful um, for them, both in the, the hands on support that they gave during this project for writing the grant for this um, and for their continued support in making their collection accessible. So today I'm going to be sharing some information about Lady Bird Johnson and her incredible wardrobe, um, sharing examples of pieces from the LBJ National Historical Parks collection. Um, this presentation will kind of be broken down into three sections that share kind of thematic overviews of how Lady Bird approached her wardrobe. So. The role of First Lady is a unique one, one that has 21st century individuals we might be uniquely positioned to consider. In a time when social media allows people from so many different backgrounds and interests to be thrust into the international spotlight, we might consider what it meant for, to be a First Lady like Claudia Lady Bird Johnson. In that role, Lady Bird was transformed from a somewhat everyday person, a wife, a mother, a social architect, and a businesswoman, to an international figure whose presence and politics were of interest to people like and unlike her. As Lady Bird was fond of saying, the First Lady is an unpaid public servant elected by one person, her husband. That quote holds two compelling ideas in it that a first lady is raised up and is accountable to her husband, which is a very mid-century ideal inherent to, um, to a role being framed through being a spouse that today might feel a little bit outdated. But it also states that the role of first lady is that of a public servant, a government official whose work is dedicated to, in this case, the American people. Maintaining that delicate balance, one between a personal relationship and a democratic duty, is an incredible challenge to a public figure. Lady Bird Johnson was acutely aware of her responsibility to strike that balance, and one of the most compelling ways she did that was through her clothing. Lady Bird was a transformational first lady, taking the role to new and important territory. Importantly, she used her fashion choices as a form of soft cultural diplomacy and often used her dress to buttress presidential policy, bringing big ideas to a personal scale and to create a sense of cultural specificity and pride for Texans and the broader American public. Those conscious decisions, which fashion historian Joanne Eicher would call addressing the body, allowed her to be both an individual and a representative of larger cultural ideals. More specifically, her sartorial decisions, often leaning towards American designers, workwear styles, and later international brands, were seen as significant in their time and often commented on in press coverage, <laughs> and were also layered with more meaning when they were selected for, for preservation in the collections of museums, archives, and historical parks. As we explore the holdings of the Lyndon Baines Johnson National Historical Park, we'll consider the ways in which Lady Bird harnessed the semiotic power of fashion at varying points in her public life, while considering the ways in which, extant, um, in which this extant collection of her clothing still shapes our understanding of her activism beyond the role of First Lady. This collection is particularly dynamic as it moves beyond the after six cocktail and evening clothing that we often associate with special occasions and public moments. 
These holdings remind us of the myriad perspectives embodied by this public servant, who, at the end of the day, was also just a person with her own tastes and interests. Again, I want to thank the staff of the LBJ National Historical Park and the Western National Parks Association for their support of this research, their efforts to digitize their unique holdings, and their broader work to make the stunning collection of artifacts available to us all. In late December 1963, West German Chancellor Ludwig Erhard arrived at the Texas Hill Country. The international press turned their attention to what would later be called the Texas White House, where LBJ and Lady Bird were set to host their first international diplomat. Unlike the delicate china and orchestras arranged during the, Ke the Kennedy presidency, this event had a distinctly German-American feel. 500 pounds of brisket were cooked, Time Magazine celebrated the Chancellor's new 10-gallon hat, and the Washington Post termed the coin, excuse me, coined the term for the Johnson's unique form of politicking, barbecue diplomacy. Of course, we shouldn't be surprised by the shift in tone of the presidency. The Johnsons were proud of their Texan culture, and though it came across as informal, it involved a cultural authenticity and type of Americanness celebrating regional specificity that ran through the presidency and Lady Bird's time as First Lady. Lady Bird grew up in rural East Texas, developing a lifelong love of nature. When she moved with LBJ to his family's ranch, her wardrobe continued to reflect the comfort and practicality that facilitated an easy relationship with the outdoors. When I assisted with evaluating the LBJ National Historical Park's holdings, I was delighted to find a variety of hard-wearing, khaki-colored work clothing, a type of women's wear rarely collected and even less frequently celebrated. These garments included practical design features, reinforced seams, um, sturdy twill fabric and easy care cotton, but also more personal elements like a monogrammed LBJ on the center of the chest pocket of both of these shirts. Lady Bird was photographed wearing um, a Western style shirt from the Parks Collection in 1959, which you can see in this photo, when LBJ served as a Senator. The pair stands in front of a cactus and a tooled leather saddle, signifying their connections with ranch culture and communicating a close relationship with their Texan constituency. And as you can see from the photograph on the left taken by the historical park staff, its practical design ensured that the piece is in great condition still today. Through her time as a First Lady, Lady Bird continued to demonstrate her connection with ranch culture, though occasionally with an eye towards high design. This polyester and leather ensemble was a favorite of Lady Bird's and was created by American designer Anne Klein. Klein is best remembered today for creating some of the first pantsuits and professional separates for a generation of women entering the workforce in the late 60s and early 70s. Often borrowing design details from menswear, Klein's design made pants more approach approachable and acceptable option at a time when women's cultural roles were shifting. For a national audience viewing photographs of Lady Bird, the context of the ranch would have made donning this bifurcated garment less shocking, especially with its neutral colors and hard-wearing leather elements. However, these high-design trousers would have signaled both an authenticity in engaging with ranching culture and a more progressive stance on women's culture. Of course, no exploration of Lady Bird's relationship with the Texas Hill Country would be complete without a nod to her engagement with wildflowers, perhaps her most enduring legacy. Like flowers, fashion is often framed as decorative, pretty, and devoid of deep meaning, but that belies the power that both hold. Lady Bird's legacy with wildflowers is often remembered as a beautification campaign, one set on making the world a more lovely and kind place. However, her work really related more deeply to environmentalism and community building, efforts to empower people through pride in the unique neighborhood of their, the unique details of their neighborhood, town, region, or state. So these hats, though pretty, offer more. The hand painted blue bonnets remind us of the native species that thrive around the LBJ ranch, these plants that don't require chemicals or much care to grow. Much like the over 40 national parks created during LBJ's presidency, these flowers showcase the natural beauty of the country. This handmade vest grows out of the regional pride that Lady Bird's wildflower campaign sparked in many people. Created by Becky Couch Patterson, the garment includes a variety of flowers cut from fabric and stitched to the vest or applique and embellished with embroidery. Its colors, 
shapes and textures frame this as a wearable work of art reinforced by the designer stitch signature on the inside, which you can see in the photograph on the left. However, when we look more closely at the motif, we might recognize a few familiar florals, blue bonnets, orange red Indian paint brushes, purple primrose and fuchsia wine cups, the native flowers that make Texas look like a distinct and unique place. The artist, a fifth generation Texan and proud German American rancher was steeped in the flora of the region and created this one of a kind garment to celebrate part of her heritage that Lady Bird promoted. Lady Bird evidently appreciated the, the gesture as a vest hangs in her closet in the Texas White House. While Lady Bird's campaign to celebrate wildflowers encouraged environmental engagement and regions celebrating their cultural specificity, her beautification work also encouraged Americans to take pride in and explore cultural offerings from coast to coast, and fashion facilitated part of that work. In February 1968, Lady Bird hosted the first and only fashion, um, excuse me, fashion show to ever take place in the White House. Under the theme, Discover America, the event featured garments appropriate for a variety of types of travel and climates that a person might experience in different places across the country, with each ensemble created by a noted American designer. In hosting this fashion show, Lady Bird encouraged national pride, curiosity about America's landscapes and cultural offerings, and promoted domestic fashion design and manufacturing while positioning herself as an approachable tastemaker. Shifting from a relatively under the radar status to that of First Lady requ required a sartorial shift. Newspapers tended to cover First Ladies on society pages where au courant styles and well-known designers would win you accolades. But Lady Bird wanted to be known first for her work, um, but especially because she followed Jackie Kennedy, she started her tenure as a First Lady fighting an uphill battle to get pr um, press coverage to cover her issues rather than her dresses. Through a series of savvy steps, Lady Bird worked closely with New York-based designers like Molly Parnas and Adele Simpson, who created this ensemble, to build a wardrobe that was eye-catching, appropriate to her lifestyle, and stewarded her through the critical gaze of fashion reporters so that her work could gain traction in other parts of news coverage. This ensemble offers clean lines and a high contrast between the bright red and white, details that photograph well, fit her physique, and cast her as a woman who dresses herself well. Additionally, being connected to Adele Simpson, an American designer known for dressing fashionable women with purpose and a businesswoman who um, herself was known for manufacturing garments domestically. As clothing made up an average of 10% of the average household expenses during Lady Bird's tenure as First Lady, the support of Adele Simpson and other American fashion designers um, really was significant in bolstering the American economy at a time when garment production was moving overseas. Wearing American Made was important to Lady Bird through her entire time as a public figure. The holdings at the LBJ National Historical Park include many examples of high design American made garments, some of the most chic examples by Norman Norell. Known as the Dean of American Fashion, Norell created classic silhouettes with pared down design details through the 1950s and 60s until his death in 1972. One of the last garments that LBJ purchased for Lady Bird was a striking Norman Norell dress, an iconic and recognizable example of the designer's work a double knit wool day dress with rows of white buttons at the center front and on the sleeves. Um, as a side note, LBJ enjoyed purchasing clothing for his female staff and for Lady Bird, often buying designer garments and bright colors um, as he preferred, um, preferred women around him to avoid mousy colors. <laughs> Uh, Lady Bird wore this clean design to LBJ's funeral, pictured here sporting the dress while talking with President Nixon. The knit fabric ensures that the garment would stretch with her without restricting her mo movement during a taxing day, while the contrast and colors of the buttons and fabric would pop in black and white photographs. And even during outdoor events, Lady Bird often maintained her allegiance to American fashion designers while thinking practically about how her wardrobe functioned with the demands of the day. This green ultra suede suit by Molly Parnas is just one of many of that fabric in the LBJ National Historical Parks collection. 
The new synthetic fabric was at the height of fashion, used primarily by well-known American designers, and offered the look of suede but could be machine laundered and didn't wrinkle in the way that many woven fabrics might, making it ideal for a woman who needed to always be photo ready. Her decades-long relationship with the designer, Molly Parnas, um, she was a friend who also served, served as a designer stylist to Lady Bird, um, ensured that her numerous ultra-suede garments were at the peak of fashion and could re be replaced easily if an activity like spreading seeds at the National Wildflower Research Center proved too taxing on her clothing. A fun detail about this and several of the other um, ultra suede garments in the collection is that many of them included small holes on the lapels, um, suggesting that Lady Bird probably personalized some of these ensembles with brooches and pins. And photographs often show her wearing floral themed brooches um, when she was out in, in the public wearing these pieces. While serving as First Lady, Lady Bird encountered an incredible amount of scrutiny, which might be expected of someone that was one of the few highly visible female American political figures. During her tenure as First Lady then, her wardrobe was sub subject to innocent curiosity from American citizens uh, and to evaluation from both the fashion and political press to critics reading into the political platforms embodied through her dress. Uniquely, the LBJ National Historical Park offers um, holdings offer insight into a ladybird whose image was still crafted, but whose sartorial choices are represented from a longer chronology and through the different roles that she played. In my opinion, some of the most striking and interesting ensembles connect the less formal environment on the LBJ Ranch and the international cultures that were important to Lady Bird. These move beyond the narrow cultural mandate to support American designed and manufactured clothing and offer glimpses into a more experimental aesthetic that leans into the independent thinking often associated with Texas Hill Country. A favorite, of, um, a favorite in Lady Bird Johnson's wardrobe is this bright pink tunic that made an appearance during Christmas festiv festivities at the LBJ Ranch in 1965. As a public figure, Lady Bird gravitated to simple garments and solid colors, but in her private life, she enjoyed a more decorative and often bolder um, set of design decisions. However, like many of her sartorial choices, this one can be read through many lenses. On one hand, the pink and green and silver read as a tangent from the traditional red and green of Christmas, the silver embroidery picking up the sparkle and the tinsel on the tree. This longer length tunic, side slits, and the embroidery placement relate this piece to, a tradition, um, to traditional Indian garments, which were considered particularly stylish at the time, particular, um, in part because of the increased international cultural president, presence of India and the country's relatively warm relations with the United States. And if we look more closely at the embroidery, we can appreciate that the botanical details here, a band of geometric flowers at the bottom hem and a larger bota, which is a tear shaped motif um, signifying life through its botanical form, might offer a connection with Lady Bird's interest in flowers and environmentalism. Beyond her tenure as First Lady, Lady Bird stayed in the public eye as an approachable figure of interest. She appeared in a number of newspaper and magazine articles and was even featured on the cover of a few women's magazines. This August 1974 issue of McCall's shows Lady Bird on the cover, confidently meeting the eyes of the magazine's readership. While she sports well-known American fashion designers work on other covers, this one stands out as a testament to her more personal style. A long unbleached cotton hostess dress includes bright textured embroidery at the neckline and sleeve cuffs. In the photograph on the cover, the brilliant bands of pink and orange complement her bold jewelry and bright lip color and draw attention upward to her face. The more casual bohemian dress is by Josefa, a designer known today as the mother of Mexican fashion design, who was an ethical designer who engaged craftspeople in small Mexican villages to complete embroidery for her designs as a way to continue their, um, their heritage making practices. As Lady Bird spent time in Mexico and was familiar with Mexican heritage living in Texas, this dress speaks to her identity as a worldly individual with deep roots in the region. In the 1970s, Lady Bird's sartorial identity really shifted from White House to Texas White House. Her wardrobe included many of these prairie style um, dresses, 
their easy care lightweight cotton fabric and romantic construction details, recalling a practical and somewhat nostalgic idea of, American, of the American Southwest pass. This message seems particularly appropriate for at least one occasion where she wore this dress, as here Lady Bird is um, pictured at the National Ranching Heritage Center, where the figures beside her sport paisley handkerchiefs, another signifier of a sort of historic cowboy culture. Though this dress no longer has, um, it does not have designer labels, it does have some um, interesting information in it, including a retailer's label stating that this dress was purchased at El Buzon, a specialty boutique um, in nearby Ingram, Texas. An advertisement from that period shows fashionable young women wearing similar white dresses as pared down bridal styles, though the sort of low key Southwestern bohemianism had a, um, a broader appeal than just as wedding style. And really, altogether, this is the enduring fashion legacy of Lady Bird Johnson. Through her time in the public eye, before, during, and after her tenure as the First Lady, she gracefully traversed bridges connecting all of her roles as a private and public person. As a strong female leader, she used her clothing effectively to communicate her political positions, but somehow always managed to maintain her authenticity as a wife, mother, Texan, and avid outdoors person. She managed to um, promote an image of approachable fashionability tied to American design and manufacturing, while also sporting practical, hardy workwear and romantic regional and international designs, as comfortable on Pennsylvania Avenue, Avenue as in walking through a field of wildflowers. Thank you. Thank you, Annette, so much for all that information and for all the work that you did on this fashion project. Lady Bird is such an inspiration, and I just love how she took all the pieces of fashion throughout that time period and all the multiculturalism and showed her appreciation for that throughout her time as first lady and as she came back to the Texas Hill Country. Thank you again. Have a good evening.